All right, thank you for everybody for coming today. Um, resiliency here is a pretty big topic, and so we have, um, we, and we all have our kind of favorite stories about things that we've learned about resiliency, a uh, favorite story or lesson that we learned over time, um, and favorite or most memorable, I suppose. And so we're each going to be sharing our own personal favorite story about, or lesson about resiliency. Uh, each of us has uh, experience building various services in AWS that you use. We've worked on Amazon.com in various, various of us have done that over the years. And so kind of combined, we've learned a bunch of lessons in each of these environments. And so as we learn these lessons and we share them with each other, those lessons and become part of sort of our DNA and our culture of building reliable and resilient services. But it takes, takes sharing and talking about, so that's what we're gonna do here today is hopefully share about our lessons and then you can kind of take those, uh, take those yourself. Cut the shatter back there, guys. <laughs> so there are five of us um, and we have five quick lightning talks. And so um, normally what we do is we have a longer talk. We can get into more detail about everything. But here we're just going to have five kind of just the, just the kind of short version of a bunch of things. And so because we are trying to cram five talks into one hour, we're doing a format that's sort of like a lightning talk. So it's, uh, these are talks that are short, to, short and sweet, and they'll probably have you thinking about, well, I don't know about that. I don't think the, the thing that they're talking about really addresses the full problem. And you'd be right. We're just going to be talking about things on the surface. Um, the, t the subjects or the topics that we'll go into will start with how Amazon became obsessed with looking at high percentile latency instead of averages, and how important that we found that to be for a customer experience. Then we'll talk about static stability, which is a concept of architecting your system so that it keeps running even when a dependency is impaired. Then shuffle sharding, which is about magical resource isolation uh, in a multi-tenant system of keeping workloads isolated from each other. We'll talk about retries, back off, and jitter, which it will improve your availability by you know, kind of giving every request an extra shot, but also paradoxically can uh, degrade your availability. So that's a kind of an interesting topic. And then we'll wrap up with a sort of a meta lesson about, about these lessons. So we, um, uh, we weren't really sure, these talks don't build on each other, so we weren't really sure what order to put them in. So we found that, oh, actually it's a useful kind of fun sort order here, um, except of course Mark screws it up. So uh, plus I'm gonna go after Mark anyway, so whatever, but anyway, so. Um, this is the intro. Now we'll kind of get into the good stuff. And here is Andrew Certain. Thanks, David. Sorry for the chatter in the back. It's very hard to get five principal engineers together and not form a peanut gallery. All right, so this is an in-person version of a tweet thread I published a few months ago. Um, I recently aggregated it on a blog for one-stop shopping. It started with this tweet from Tim Bray, who's an Amazon distinguished engineer. And I really wanted to explain what P49s meant, because it may not be obvious to everyone, and why we care about it. So really dryly, P49s means the 99.99th percentile. But what the heck does that mean? So it's the value that is greater than or equal to 99.99% of the data points. So only one in 1,000 data points is bigger than this. Um, sorry, 10,000. It's pretty hard to visualize 10,000 numbers, but here's 100 numbers. So what if I asked you, what's the 99th percentile of, this, of these numbers, right? What number is bigger than or equal to 99 out of 100? Do we have any guesses? That is a terrible guess. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so well, what if I sorted them, right? So now I sort them left to right and top to bottom. It's pretty easy to pick it out, right? It's the next to the last number. Um, I typically tell people just as a rule of thumb, if you have a percentile, you should have at least 10 times as many data points as that percentile, because the, you know, the next to last is gonna be super noisy, so it's also easy to pick out the 90th percentile. Okay, so that's what percentiles are. I wanna take you on a little journey. Um, this is what the Amazon website looked like in 2001. At the time, I was working as the manager of the performance engineering team, and our job was to worry about the latency and throughput of the Amazon website. And at the time, mostly we were looking at averages. 
And so this is the story about how we switched from averages to looking at percentiles. And so in the performance engineering team, we looked at a lot of graphs. Um, I did a lot of uh, GNU plot, um, looking at the customer experience. And so here's a plot I made. Um, this is a histogram of page latencies. I know it's uh, pretty hard to read the text. I would have loved to have regenerate this graph, but all I have left is the picture. This is from 2001, like I said before. At the bottom is latency, and then on this side is the number of pages in that bucket, and I'll talk about this later. So how do you read a histogram? It's pretty straightforward. So let's pick a latency. This happens to be about one second. You go up to the point in the graph, and you look over to the side, and so we can see about 7,000 pages were served in this time period with about a second of latency. Okay, so this graph has another plot on it. Um, this lower plot tracks the abandon ratio. So this is the ratio of pages that were served in this time bucket for which it was the customer's last page view. It's not always bad if something's the last page view, right? But it's something we want to pay attention to. And so one interesting thing about this graph is you can see that the latency actually, um, as the latency increases, the abandon rate decreases. So one thing you could take from this is, hey, we should add more latency, right? Because latency is good. Um, that wasn't the conclusion I made. I think, you know, more features do cost latency, and sometimes those are good, um, but not always. But we had a really hard time making this argument to feature owners, right? Because feature owners love features, and um, they're like, look, they're doing great, so why do we care about latency? Right, okay, so the, for example, this is 20%. Sorry, anyway. All right, so here's another graph. Um, this is from the exact same period of time, the same two hours, but a different slice of data. Um, and the question is, what's this hump? So this is my rendering of what the Amazon website looked like in 2001. Um, we had load balancers, and then they went to web servers, and then we had some databases behind the web servers. And these databases tracked things such as what items I had in my shopping cart, um, other stuff about who I was as a customer. So they were the session state for when you were viewing Amazon. Um, and on that day, one of these databases was having some trouble. And it, it was very interesting the kind of trouble it was having. So it was adding latency to page times. It was totally randomly distributed, though. This was, for me, this was this great natural experiment. So customers were randomly assigned to databases, so there was nothing special about the customers that got assigned to this one database. And the latency was just being randomly added to page views. So it wasn't that recognized customers got more latency or customers that visited this kind of page got more latency. It was just totally randomly dis uh, distributed. So sometimes when you went to the Amazon website, you got a page that rendered in a half a second to two seconds. That's the big part of the graph there. And then sometimes we added an extra eight to 30 seconds to your rendering time. So unsurprisingly, if you got one of these really slow pages, it was more likely that you would abandon the website. That's not actually what disturbed me the most. What disturbed me the most was this part of the graph. And so if we overlay the two graphs, you can see that if the web, if the database was not adding any latency, you got exactly normal page latency distribution, but the abandonment rates were totally different. Right? So if you look here, we are at about a 20% abandonment rate for customers that were hitting the good databases, and about a 30% abandonment rate for customers that were not hitting the good database. Right? And so the only explanation for why these abandonment rates were different was the extra page latency in that other part of the distribution. So you're, imagine you're a customer, you're coming along, you're getting pages, or take about a second to load, da, 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 da. and then one takes like 16 seconds to load, and you're like, uh, I don't know if I want to wait, and then it comes. And then you click again, and it even just takes a half second, you're just like, forget it, I'm done, right? And so this was the sort of big lesson from this um, event, was latency is, I mean, humans are not 
linear functions. I think we all know that, right? So you're not twice as likely to abandon if the latency is twice as high, right? We have some threshold. And so from this experiment, we determined the threshold was around six seconds. Um, and then we thought to ourselves, okay, so how are we gonna use this to convince all of the VPs that they really have to care about this? So we showed them the graph. We couldn't say, okay, well, you can never serve a page over six seconds, right? That's, the hard, that's not very actionable, it's very hard to do. So we thought to ourselves, we said, well, if the session is about 10 pages on average, and we have about a one in 10,000 chance that a page is served with about six seconds of latency, then about one in 1,000 customers will have a high latency page. And so we set the goal at one in, no more than one in 10,000 pages can be served at more than six seconds of latency, and that is how P49s came to be. I would all encourage you to be looking at percentiles. CloudWatch supports percentiles, it has for a while. They recently made it much, much easier to get your data in and get it out as percentiles. They launched this thing called an embedded metric format. Um, as David said, we don't have a ton of time. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but I would highly encourage you to check it out. So here's a Lambda function that uses the Node.js client library. You see you just add this uh, library and then you add some dimensions and now you can get percentiles out of CloudWatch. If you wanna do it yourself, they specify how you can write JSON in your log and then you can um, have any, uh, any of your own customer metrics in as percentiles. And here you can see on the CloudWatch uh, console page, you, know, you can look at statistics like P99 or P49s, you can set alarms. So I highly encourage you to follow Amazon's lead and look at your percentiles. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrew. So my name is Becky. I think I have the 40th percentile talk here. Is that right? Is that how this works? Um, all right, I'm gonna share with you kind of my sort of, I've worked for AWS as an engineer for about six years, and I wanted to share with you um, one of the most, I gotta say one of the most profound insights that I have learned uh, in my time at AWS, and that's how to think about various kinds of dependencies. It's a concept called static stability, which I'm gonna define. It is, I'll warn you, it is somewhere on that spectrum between like, like duh, that was obvious, and boy, that's really profound. So I don't know how you're gonna take it, probably somewhere along that spectrum, but uh, dependencies, you have dependencies, right? If you're, in, if you're building any kind of a service, you're depending on other services. If you're a customer of AWS, you're depending on AWS. If you think you have no dependencies, you probably are running on computers, so you have dependencies. Um, so, you know, if you think about a very simple kind of architecture here, where system one depends on system two, what does that mean? Well, that means that uh, when your callers make a call into system one, making some kind of a request, and uh, system one needs some data from system two, that's what it means to have a dependency. System one calls into system two to get this data, system two has this data somewhere associated with it, maybe in a data store that's associated with or something like that. System two returns the data, system one does some sort of transform on the data and you return a result to your caller. That's a dependency. Of course, the consequence of the dependency here is that um, when system two, you know, we all, you know, you've heard it from, you've heard it here from us before. You, you know, you design with failure in mind. Um, okay, so design with failure in mind, system two fails, therefore system one fails. This is simple, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. This is just, you know, it's, it's a simple fact of this simple architecture. But, you know, let's make it complicated. I got some math for you, right? Um, System one has an availability of P and system two has an availability of Q and they're both numbers between zero and one and they're you know, independent events to be very precise about it. Uh, the, the, uh, the probability of getting through both successfully is multiplying the two numbers. When you multiply two numbers between zero and one, you end up with a number that's less than each of them. That's math. How many of you like math? I love math. How many of you don't like math? Well, I'm not here to judge, but I am judging. But if you don't like math, if you don't like math, I'll break it down for you. Dependencies reduce availability. That's just the way it is. So what do you do about that? Well, one thing you could do about it is just say this is okay, right? System two's got a really high availability target. It's okay to depend on it, right? If you're depending on, you know, one of, if you're depending on a service that you know is built to a higher availability target, then you should absolutely do it this way, not complicate things. But 
Sometimes in the real world, you come, up with, you come into situations where you need data from another system and you want to carefully manage that dependency. This is uh, what it's like to use EC2, right? Your customer of EC2, you've got two virtual machines in the cloud, you're running your application on them, and do you know, do you, in order for your application to run like the instances need to be running, they need to have network connectivity to each other, as is shown by this wonderful animation. We call this the data plane of EC2. Now, of course, the data, these instances running, it's not the only thing EC2 does, right? The E in EC2 is for Elastic. So uh, you, as a customer, are going to show up one day, either doing this directly or indirectly by means of, like, you know, an auto-scaling group where you've said you want this many instances or it's time to scale up. Time for a new EC2 instance. Well, this is what EC2 does. There's an API called Run Instances. You call that. And from your point of view, in a couple seconds, there's your new instance. From our point of view uh, at AWS, OK, well, here's what's about to happen, right? You said something about the subnet, which implies an availability zone. So we've got to find a, data, a machine and a data center in the right availability zone that has a slot for the instance type that you asked for. And you asked for an IAM role. So there's a system to propagate those temporary credentials to your instance so you can have a great security posture and not be spreading your secrets around everywhere. You might have said something about an EBS volume, so we've got to go take care of that. Um, hey, you know what? The, the VPC, the virtual private cloud, this is a overlay network and you know and we've talked a little bit about how this network works and in order for an overlay network to work everybody else in your because these IP addresses were assigned by you not us so everybody else in your network needs to know where to find your instance to have connectivity among all three of them and that is the control plane of EC2 after all of that you get your new instance and it has connectivity to everything else now in terms of dependencies the data plane does have a dependency on data from the control plane, but I got two questions for you thinking about these two systems. Number one, which of these systems is more important to the success of your customers? At our customers is EC2, the control plane or the data, well, they're both very, very important, right? We take the availability of both these systems incredibly seriously, but if you think about the day job of EC2 is those virtual machines you're running those applications on, on a day-to-day, -day, on a continuous basis, you rely on the availability of this data plane for your application to work. The control plane does come into play when you need to scale up, scale down, change something, change a security group rule, but those events are more rare than the data plane, which is basically just going on the whole time. So the data plane is more important to your success as a, as a customer of AWS, therefore it's more important to us. Um, question two. Which of these systems have a higher complexity? Well, if you were listening to my spiel about data planes and control planes, you notice I said a lot more words about the control plane. It's more complicated. So what do we do about that? Well, there's a pattern in AWS for managing it, for being able to use the data of another system, but be able to be completely resilient in the face of its failure, like almost not know that it exists. So here I'll put our system one, system two back on the page. Again, remember, system two fails, system one fails. I'm going to show you a different way to do this. And this is a pattern we see, this is a pattern we see many places around AWS, a pattern that you can employ when system two, when system one needs data from system two, but needs to be available in the face of an impairment. And the, the pattern always looks like this. I'm going to be vague about whether it's a push or a pull. We see both. Um, but if you can somehow asynchronously get this data of system two up into system one, so that when someone calls system one, it already has the data locally, locally or locally, somewhere in the boundary of system one. Uh, well, you do introduce a little bit of complexity here, like what's doing that propagation, and that thing in turn can fail. And of course, you know, there's, uh, there's eventual consistency here, right? When a change gets made to system two, it's not instantaneously reflected in system one. So all of these things are things you gotta measure and monitor and keep working. But when you need system two to hit that much higher availability target, you are, right? Think about what happens in the case of an impairment of system two. Uh, in the case of an impairment of system two, on the left-hand side, system one's also impaired. On the right-hand side, system one is working with an asterisk. It's not getting updates from system two, but for most customers, it's working. And that, is what, that concept is what we call statically, static stability. Say so the system one is statically stable. 
So in practice, in a system, when we build a system like EC2, we think very carefully about these control planes and data planes because of those two questions I asked you. And the data plane is built to be statically stable. If you look at, you know, if you look at how we talk about, for example, how the virtual private cloud works, you'll see that data that's needed for the overlay networks is pushed down asynchronously. And that way, the data plane doesn't even know about the control plane. If there's an impairment above the line, then down the line, you could even reboot and you would still have everything that you need. So what does this mean to you as a customer of AWS? Well, OK, let's build a high availability workload. So let's go into a region, make a VPC, put subnets in our uh, availability zones. Now you know availability zones have the word availability to you. We're showing you our basket so you can put eggs in multiple baskets. Let's, you know, let's, let's put an application load balancer. Let's load balance across uh, the three different availability zones in this, in this fake region here. And um, OK. Um, you know, maybe we have a database, and so again, we're going to use two different availability zones. Database a little bit different here because, you know, you have a single master. Okay, let's talk about what happens in this case. Um, you know, the very, very, very rare event. But this, it's designed to work this way. These are designed to have separate failure characteristics from each other, so let's think about it failing the way AWS says it's going to. Well, okay, uh, let's, so maybe should we do something, should we do something like this? It's fa there's a failure. Spin up some new instances in response to the failure. What do you think? Is this a good idea or not? Think about static stability. We're responding to some problem in our dependency in the moment. Um, have you ever run, ridden a bike, driven a car in the rain? You know, this, per this person in the picture, she's probably going pretty fast because she's dressed very differently to ride her bike than when I ride my bike. But uh, she's, she's going fast, it's in the rain. You know what, in the rain, things get slippery. The rain is different than the sunshine. If you change direction while it's raining, something that you're not expecting is gonna happen. Well, so that's why we recommend that, you know, that, that you not have this plan to respond to failure while it's raining. You should be ready for fail. When you're thinking about your dependencies, you should be ready for failure before it happens. So if you already were running at a capacity where you could be down to two availability zones and not even notice it, then you're winning. And actually, with the database case, there is a little bit of stuff you need to do, and you know you actually do need to fail over, you know, typically a, a DNS name change at least. Um, but this is kind of the pattern I want you to come away from sort of thinking about. Again, it's somewhere between obvious and profound. But when you're, you know, take dependencies the simple way. If you're taking a dependency on something with a really high availability target, don't complicate your world like this. But if you need to, if you need to be more available than the system that's giving you your data, you want to think about how you can make it so that when it starts raining, that you can be almost blissfully unaware of it, not have to change your direction, not have to do anything different. It applies to your use of AWS, it applies to your own systems as well. Thank you very much. I'm gonna pass this over to Colm here. Um, so I'm glad I got to talk about shuffle sharding here in Vegas. Uh, if you pass the blackjack tables, you probably notice uh, probably more shuffling happens in this city than probably anywhere else in the world. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to talk about a different kind of, um, of shuffling. Uh, shuffle sharding is a technique we use uh, to isolate customers from one another or customers' resources from one another. That's kind of a go-to technique we use in a lot of different places. Um, but I'm going to start somewhere else. This is, uh, this is a picture of me about 15 years ago. Uh, it used to, be, used to be, my, be my job to build private data centers. Um, uh, this, this was one of the last ones I built before I uh, actually came to AWS. And uh, it took me about a year, start to end, you know, lots of project planning, uh, lots of working with different vendors and builders and contractors and all sorts of things uh, to get about 32 racks of equipment ultimately provisioned, right? And um, these days I work on ELB, and we spin up, you know, routinely spin up equivalent amounts of capacity in like seconds and minutes, and it's a, and it's a whole different world. Um, but uh, one of, you know, one of the challenges of that, right, it, the great, great thing about elasticity is about access to that scale and can do things so quickly. But in order for us to operate at that scale, one of our core competencies needs to be making sure that even though, you know, we're delivering customers all these benefits of, you know, economies of scale and efficiency that comes from us, you know, sharing and pooling our resources and all, you know, using the same physical data centers, uh, 
we want to make sure that our customers still get a you know, first-class experience and that they feel like actually we're delivering them their own you know, virtual private data center or like virtual private clouds like we have. Uh, and, and managing that multi-tenancy is like just a really big uh, core competency for us. And, and that's, that's what Shuffle Sharding is all about. And, and so to see how it works, uh, let's think of like a pretty normal, horizontally scalable service. Lots and lots of services are built like this where you've got you know, end servers or workers right, doing some kind of work. These could be web servers, uh, as they were in Andrew's example earlier when he showed the architectural diagram. And uh, you, know, you run your service, and they, each worker takes requests. You might have a load balancer in front of it, or DNS, or something like that. And it's just, just spreading the traffic you know, as evenly as you can so that uh, you get that nice horizontal scalability. But then, you know, someday, something bad happens. Right? Uh, one of your customers or some resource either you know, makes uh, a, a bad request, something you hadn't planned for, something you hadn't got you know, full coverage for in your testing, um, and it impacts the server. Uh, it might not just be a bad request. It might be like a flood of requests. Right? You might have a customer or a client that gets stuck inside a retry storm, uh, and, and, and that can take out your worker. And uh, when, the, when, the, when the worker fails, you know, the load balancing system generally notices, takes it out of service, uh, but that can cascade, right? Because the other workers are going to take over, and the requests are just going to go there instead, right? And um, a lot, a lot of services are built like this. Like, this is kind of the default pattern that you see out there in the world. Uh, there's nothing surprising about this architecture. Um, but the blast radius of this kind of failure, or the kind of scope of impact, uh, is that you know, if we do have that kind of cascading issue, every single customer is going to be impacted. Right? One noisy neighbor caused everybody to have a bad experience, and that's, that's not good. Uh, a very traditional solution for this is, is just ordinary sharding. Right? So uh, you take the same fleet, and you divide it up into, say, four shards like I have here. And you, know, you take each customer a resource, and you say, well, you go on the blue shard, you go on the, you know, the yellow shard, uh, and so on. And in that world, uh, if, if, the, if you repeat the same uh, occurrence, uh, you might have a shard taken out of service, but not, not the whole service, right? Uh, and that's obviously much better. Uh, there are you know, a few little downsides. You get less efficiency, because you generally have to have a bit more slack in the system, uh, because you've just kind of reduced the size of each shard and, and the amount of slack capacity within each shard. But in general, like, this is a, a really good improvement. Uh, and the scope of impact you know, for problems in this kind of architecture is reduced by the number of shards. Right? So if, you, if you've got four shards, then you know, your worst case scenario is, well, a quarter of your customers might be impacted. Right? Much, much better, worth doing. And if you do have a horizontally scalable architecture that you know, sharding can be added to, um, don't, it, it, it's not worth knocking. It can be an easy thing to add. Um, but with shuffle sharding, we can do much, much better. using and the, the crazy thing about shuffle sharding is we can do much, much better with the same number of resources and the same level of efficiencies in terms of Slack capacities and so on. We're just going to use math to assign customers in smart ways uh, that drastically, dramatically reduce the blast radius uh, or the scope of impact of issues. Uh, and so a really simple example is let's take our nodes. Right? So I still have eight nodes, still have eight workers. And then I take all my customers. You know, here I've got a bunch represented by different icons. And uh, I just randomly assign each customer to a pair of nodes. Right? And so if I look at the, the, the customer that's the, the heart icon, that's assigned to worker one and worker four. Right? But no other customer is assigned to that combination of two nodes. And that's important. Uh, we call that its virtual shuffle chart. Right? The, the heart has nodes one and node, nodes four. And if, if the hard customer has you know, a retry storm or something like that, it might impact those two nodes. But no other customer is fully impacted by that. If you look at, if you look at you know, Hart's neighbors, like the crown, well, the crown can get service now from node two, uh, which, is, which is pretty cool. Or the, or the other um, neighbor that Hart has is the dice there on node four. Well, the dice can get service uh, from node six. And so, as long as the protocol or application has some kind of retry semantics or some kind of fault tolerance and work around that little temporary unavailability of one node, which is very typical, most services work like that, 
um, no, one else is, no one else is impacted. And this reduces blast radius just astronomically. It actually reduces it um, by a combinatorial factor, depending on how many nodes you have and depending on how, how big your shards are. Um, and combinatorial math generally works out to being factorials, which are numbers that just go really, really, really quickly. Uh, if you do this math on a really simple example with eight nodes, uh, the shard size of two, so the example I just worked through, if a single customer uh, you know, were, were to trigger an issue, 53.6% um, of other customers don't share any nodes with them at all. Uh, about 42.8% uh, share one node, um, so they shouldn't see impact, they should be able to survive that, and only 3.6%, it's so really, really small, about seven times better uh, than we did with normal sharding. And this gets better and better the, the more nodes you have or the bigger your shard size is. Um, you know, on AWS Hyperplane, which is this core system in our network, we run with uh, 100 nodes and our shard size is five, and the, the numbers just get astronomically small really quickly. Uh, you know, the blast radius is 0 .0000013. Uh, it's, it's, it's incredible. Uh, for Route 53, the numbers are even bigger again. Um, all that this depends on is having a client that's fault tolerant, some kind of ruining mechanism, and some way to lay this stuff out in advance. Uh, and, it, and it really is great. We use it at all sorts of layers. If you want to know more detail, uh, we just published an article on this. Check it out. But I also have a, a tool. If you follow me on Twitter, I'll post it later today. Uh, that can actually calculate those numbers for you. That's all I had. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass the baton to Mark. Excuse my uh, hobbling around a little bit. I should have listened to Becky when she told me it was slippery when it rained. Um, it's very slippery in the city, it turns out. Um, hi, I'm Mark. I'm going to talk about retries, back off, and, uh, and jitter. Um, but before I do that, uh, you know, why do we build distributed systems? Uh, distributed systems are a bit of a pain, right? Like, they're hard to monitor relatively compared to a single system. Uh, they're hard to uh, reason about relatively to a single system. Um, you know, they uh, introduce all kinds of complexity around, uh, around consistency. Uh, they introduce all kinds of complexity around deployments. You have to have multiple machines. You can't just go to one thing and see how that process is doing. So why do we bother? Well, we bother for two reasons. One of those reasons is for scale. Because we have more work than we can fit on a single, a single host, a single box, right? So you know, we have a, a, you know, our biggest box can handle 10,000 requests a second, and our customers send us a million. We have no choice but to scale out in some way. The other reason we do that is because failures happen. And uh, we want our system to be more available than a single node. We want our system to have higher availability than any single node with its you know, fallible hardware and fallible power and network and so on. You know, and fallible software, to be honest, and that's a big cause of outages. So you know, we want to have higher availability than any single node uh, can provide. Um, and how does, you know, how fundamentally do distributed systems achieve this? Well, Colm's math was very enlightening because it shows, you know, one way that sort of combinatorially you achieve it. But kind of going back to the re sort of most fundamental reason, distributed systems achieve high availability and resilience through redundancy, through having more than one copy of a piece of data, through having more than one server that can handle a particular request, through having more than one network path that can get your information from your client to your service and back. And this is probably the most important you know, single, uh, single thing about, uh, about availability. But you know, one, one challenge here is, uh, is how your clients um, achieve this, right? If there are two servers uh, and, uh, and one of them's broken, um, how do you get back to sending the traffic to the healthy server. Well, you do that with health checks. Uh, you do that with, uh, you know, with load balancer features. You can do that with DNS. There are a whole lot of good patterns for, uh, for doing that. But at the moment of failover, at the moment you go from one, you know, two servers to one, or more difficult, 
uh, you know, 1,000 servers to, uh, to 700 because uh, there was a large-scale infrastructure failure. Uh, it's going to take a while for, for those health check mechanisms to catch up. And so the way that we handle these, you know, these, these failures and these edge cases where, where health checks take a while, and the cases where uh, there are transient failures, right, like the network is dropping some percentage of packets, is we add retries, right? So a client goes to the system and says, can you do some work for me? I want to get that thing. I want to create a new thing. I want to get that page. And if that doesn't work, we do a retry. So the client says, hey, um, the last time I tried this, it didn't work. Let me try again. Um, and so that's very, very, you know, it's, it's, it's a basic idea. Well, you know, retries are a fantastic idea because they allow us to achieve this kind of fundamental property of distributed systems of higher availability through redundancy. And what's the problem with retries? Well, the problem with retries um, is that they can also destroy availability. Your retries, if the reason that your system is falling over is because it's under too much load, retries going, go from being your availability friend, a tool to improve availability, to being your enemy, a tool of you know, de denial of service attacking your own system. And this is a really big problem. Um, because clients, right, out there in the world, there are lots and lots and lots of clients, millions of customers with web browsers, hundreds of thousands of IoT devices, whatever the case may be, don't tend to be able to coordinate against, um, amongst each other to say, well, you know, we think the service is down because it's overloaded, or we think the service is down because it's got random errors. And you don't want them to coordinate, because how would they do that? Well, they would do that, you know, probably through a service, uh, and you've just moved, uh, you know, you just moved your problem from, uh, from one place to another. So what do we do about this? How do we, uh, how do we prevent uh, destroying our service under load? Well, we add latency. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and this is called back off. This is where a service goes and says, you know, or the client says, instead of I'm going to try at millisecond 100, millisecond, uh, you know, 101, millisecond 102, instead tries at millisecond 100, and then 200, 400, and so on. And that's called exponential back off. And it's a very standard thing to build into clients. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a really good idea, again, because, you know, as these clients get further and further away in back off time, uh, you know, you, the, the amount of traffic to the service kind of settles back down to, uh, back down to where it was. And that's obviously only useful if, uh, if you can back off, right? You know, you think about Andrew's data, about customers don't want high latency, so in some cases, you would rather inject errors potentially than latency, or you would rather, uh, you know, degrade some features than inject latency. So this isn't a perfect solution, but it's a very, very useful solution. Um, but there's one thing to, uh, to pay careful attention to uh, when, you know, when adding, adding back off, and that is, um, uh, that is, you know, if everybody backs off the same amount at the same time, because you've written this back off algorithm that says start at zero, then 100, then 200, then 400, then 800. In fact, we haven't reduced the traffic on our service at all because, you know, you, you've introduced a traffic spike at zero and a traffic spike at 100 and at 200 and at 400 and so on. So to illustrate this, I want to talk about one of my favorite foods, which is a cheesesteak. Uh, if you don't like a cheesesteak, uh, you can sort of mentally put in your own favorite food there. Um, and near my, uh, the building I work in in Seattle, uh, there is a, uh, there's a great truck that comes once a week uh, that serves a good cheesesteak. Very, very popular for good reasons. And, uh, you know, because we're these sort of fallible animals who like round numbers, um, you know, 12 o'clock rolls around and we think, oh, man, I'm hungry. I could eat a cheesesteak today. So I'm going to get out from my desk and I'm going to go, uh, you know, I'm going to go down to the truck. And I get to the truck and the queue is really long. So what do I do? I go back to my desk. It's just, you know, it's just a couple of steps away. And again, because I'm a fallible animal who likes round numbers, I'm going to stand up from my desk at 12.15 and think, hey, I should get a cheesesteak. And I go back to the cheesesteak truck, and the queue's really long. So what do I do? I go back to my desk. 12.30 rolls around. And, uh, and again, um, I get up and I try to go to the truck. And again, 
disappointed, disappointed, uh, you know, the queue is long, I don't end up getting my cheesesteak and I have to, uh, you know, eat something, uh, eat some kind of lesser food uh, for lunch. So what's happening here? Well, what's happening is because humans like round numbers, that cheesesteak truck tends to get idle between these nice round number times. You know, at 12.07 or 12.11, uh, it's actually pretty empty. And so, <clears throat> what do we need to do? How do, how, do we, uh, how do we solve this problem, right? We've got two problems here. We've got a problem of a disappointed client, right? I'm disappointed because I didn't get my cheesesteak. And we've got a problem of a cheesesteak truck that is idle for some period during the lunchtime peak. And it's really expensive. We're paying a chef, we're paying for a truck, we're paying for you know, gas and all of this stuff. Um, and we don't want to do that. So we want higher, availab you know, higher availability to customers, uh, and we want, uh, you know, we want to have higher utilization of our hardware. Um, and you know, the systems that we build have exactly the same problem. Back off, and our love of round numbers uh, builds this problem into the systems that we, uh, that we build. Um, and it's not only humans that like round numbers, we've also taught computers to like round numbers. Uh, you know, we write code, and instead of picking, you know, a random number for, uh, for a various factor, uh, we tend to pick particular times. Uh, you know, I want to do this once a day. Well, what time am I going to do it? I'm going to do it at midnight. I want to do it, you know, I, I, I want this job to be done once an hour. What time am I going to do it? I'm going to do it in the first millisecond of the hour, because why not? I'm really good at keeping time. Um, you know, and, and this leads to traffic spikes. So computers don't care about round numbers. It's just us, but we've taught computers, and, and, and they're very confused about this now. Um, so how do we get out of this problem? Well, we get out of this problem by introducing jitter, by introducing randomness into the systems that we built. Um, so if you were paying attention in Colm's talk, you would have seen that adding randomness, in his case, adds this huge amount of combinatorial availability. And it turns out that this is a broad idea, that adding some amount of randomness can replace a lot of coordination and improve the scalability and availability of systems. So let's go back to, uh, let's go back to the traffic in our cheesesteak truck for a second. Um, this is what it looks like as a, uh, as a time series. And you can see these spikes, right? Like we have the, the spike at the beginning. Um, and I've tried to change my, uh, my cheesesteak algorithm here. I've got exponential back off. So you'll see these spikes. Each, each uh, successive spike is twice as far away as the previous one. And now what happens if I introduce jitter? So instead of going back to my desk for exactly uh, you know, one minute and then two minutes and then four minutes and so on, I go back to my desk, I pick up my D20 and I roll it and I, I go back to the truck after that number of minutes. Well, the graph gets way better. Those empty periods where the cheesesteak truck was empty uh, suddenly go away. Their throughput improves, and the spikes where I had to leave because the queue was too long and I wasn't that patient also go away. And what's really magical about this, what's really magical about this is that we've done it without any coordination. To achieve this effect, clients haven't had to talk to each other at all. They haven't had to talk to a service. There's no piece of infrastructure that's needed to add this piece of information that achieves this effect. It's just magic, and it's just the kind of magic of adding these random numbers. And yes, you can theoretically do better than just adding uniform random jitter, but adding uniform random jitter is super simple, requires zero coordination, and for the most part, requires a single line of code. Um, and so there are lots of ways to think about adding jitter, uh, but this is my favorite one. So attempt is the number of tries I've done, starts at zero, goes to one and two and so on. We all know how to count. Um, and the base is, is where we start. So that can be like 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds or whatever. Um, so instead of sleeping for you know, base times two to the power of attempt, I sleep for a random number between zero and base to the two to the power of attempt. And some people looking at this say, well, you know, we can't do that because uh, some clients will be sleeping for zero time. And it turns out that's actually a good property. So some clients don't end up backing off at all between two attempts. And that helps maximally spread out those spikes. So where do we build jitter into systems in AWS? Um, well, we always try to jitter 
And, uh, you know, before I say always, I'm going to say, uh, you know, in any company like Amazon, at any thing that is as complex and big as AWS, there is really no always. Uh, there are good reasons not to do this, which I don't have time to get into, unfortunately. But almost all of the time, we use jitter, this idea of randomness, adding randomness when using back off. Um, we try and jitter periodic work timers. So this is getting rid of this bad habit of really liking round numbers and round times. So instead of running that backup job at midnight, uh, we run it you know, sometime during the day. And one of the services I worked in earlier in my career, uh, you know, we would look at our graphs, our one minute time series graph, and what we would see is, uh, you know, in any sort of given minute bucket, we would be, uh, you know, serving, uh, serving however many thousands of requests. And what we saw was that we were very, very disappointed with the performance of, of that service. Because the CPUs were running really hot for the amount of requests they were getting. And so we spent some time profiling and optimizing our software, as we do, um, and, uh, and it didn't fix things. And it was only once we went into the logs and looked at millisecond level timestamps that we realized that the biggest clients of the service were providing about 90% of the traffic in the first millisecond of every minute. And so, you know, the service would get hammered for a millisecond. There'd be, be some, some retries because it would be overloaded. But that was completely invisible on our monitoring except on the CPU metrics, which are looking at these kind of high CPU percentiles and seeing that the boxes were really, really heavily loaded. And so adding some jitter into the client fixed that and let us cut our fleet size down uh, by about 75%. So it's always a good idea to add jitter when, uh, when doing periodic work. And where you can, you can take this all the way to the extreme of adding jitter to all kinds of work. You know, where... Uh, where possible, there's always, you know, it's, 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 it's often a good idea to add some jitter, to add some random delay to any work that comes in. Because there are always things upstream that are going to send you spikes. Because humans like round numbers and computers like round numbers. So you get it with these, you know, these spikes of requests and you kind of want to spread them out. And the great way of spreading them out is, is by adding jitter. And again, going back to Andrew's talk, you can't and shouldn't always do that because you don't want to disappoint your customers in interactive things. But where you can, it's a good idea. So it's a powerful idea. Add randomness where you can. And you, know, you can get better throughput, more efficient services, better service to your client, and all of these other good systems properties with the change of just a few lines of code. I'm going to hand it back to, uh, hand it back to David. Thank you. Yeah, one thing uh, Andrew was actually mentioning, to, reminding me of, uh, another place we add jitter uh, inside of Amazon is actually not just in time, but also in size. So some services will jitter their heap size if they're running a JVM, so that if you have a bunch of servers doing the same thing, they'll kind of, uh, if you have some memory problem, they'll happen at different times instead of happening on the same server. So jitter is not just for time. All right, so finally, we're going to wrap up. Instead of like a, a technical talk like we've been seeing before, we're going to get kind of meta and about how we learn and, and share these stories. One of the most common questions we hear from customers is, how does Amazon do things? Like, how does Amazon build our resilient distributed systems that scale? How do we approach DevOps and monitor and observe our systems? How do we deploy and scale as an organization? Um, and so we've, we've, we really like these kinds of questions because they, they get us talking to each other and learning from each other, sharing ideas. Um, we've learned that this is really great to have these, these kind of conferences like reInvent because we get you all here together, not just hearing from us, but hearing from each other. And so when we share these ideas, these ideas can turn into tools that we can add to our toolkits to become better engineers with tools that improve our agility, help us go faster, tools that are just higher quality tools that will be, build things that are higher quality and more reliable. Now, some of the way that we share these ideas at these conferences like reInvent is with these kind of talks. They're lightning talks or just full-length talks. 
But talks is just kind of a bunch of air, sure they're recorded so you can go back and listen to them later. But they, talks and like communi verbal communication lets people literally hand wave about things, right? You have to stay at the same pace as the presenter in order to keep up, you can't pause and think about how something might apply to your system. Um, and so it's easier to kind of paper over the nuance and maybe miss something um, or not communicate the idea most fully. But a different way of, of communicating is written. It's kind of higher bandwidth. You can, both for the writer, they can spend more time and they kind of think a little bit more critically about an idea when you write than when you put together a talk, I think. And it also gives the reader more time to kind of go back and think about things. They can read through faster so they can get through more content or read more slowly and think more deeply. But writing is, there are a bunch of writing formats as well. There are blog posts, which you might just pick up to like get a quick idea, kind of like the lightning talk version of a document. But then there are longer papers. Papers, articles, like, um, like a lot of these topics. Um, you can maybe cover some of these topics in a few pages. Other ones might be a dozen uh, or more. You might need multiple articles. Well, this is why about two hours ago at the keynote, Werner announced the Amazon Builders Library which is a collection of living articles and videos that give readers a kind of under the hood look at how Amazon builds, designs, operates our systems and all the systems that kind of underpin how AWS and Amazon.com work. The Builders Library is written by um, kind of senior engineers like us and uh, by uh, technical executives who kind of, for the articles that they write, these are the things that they like think about and practice um, pragmatically, hands-on every day. So we're, lo we're starting with about a dozen articles, um, but then we're gonna be continuing to release more over time. And it's not you know, only, I think, I think we're expecting that it's not going to be only us sharing ideas, but it'll also be you. We expect kind of customers, partners, to be sharing ideas in this library as well. So let's take a look at some of the articles. Um, now, there is an article for everyone, for every, everything that we just talked about here, there is an article about it um, that goes into even more detail than this kind of like, you know, taste, taste of the idea that you got here in the lightning talk format. Um, so we have a few different categories. We have an architecture category, which talks about how we design and build and develop so that our systems are secure, uh, durable, available, and performant in that order. That's an important priority stack ranking. Um, we'll talk, we have uh, some articles about uh, software delivery, and that talks about how we make sure we get that agility to be able to deploy new changes to production quickly and safely, focusing on rolling back, focusing on monitoring. And then operations, where we're focusing on um, things like uh, that the monitoring and keeping a high availability for our, all of our systems. Now these topics, there, there's a, a very blurry line between all of these topics, but this can kind of help you, help you get, get a starting point. The article's also really linked to each other. So I want to kind of just describe a couple, a few of these, just to give a little bit, even, even a lighter taste than you were getting in the lightning talks. So the article on leader election, uh, leader election is a technique that we use at Amazon to, to give a certain uh, server or thread or process special privileges, maybe to, it, to uh, mutate a data store or to be able to assign work or something like that. And so this, can, this is a very helpful tool that we use at Amazon. Um, they can improve the, our availability with faster failover times. It can improve our efficiency by spreading work out across a fleet. But it also is something that we introduces new failure modes that we have to be very careful about. So that's where the, the articles are almost more interesting about how they get into the, well, you could do this, but kind of thing. Um, similarly, uh, on, in the um, software delivery category, we have uh, an article that goes into just uh, continuous deployment and how to do that and how to then be very careful about rolling back very quickly and making sure every change just kind of dips the toe into the water. There's an article in the kind of the operating category which talks about health checks. Health checks is a technique we use all throughout Amazon to make sure that servers, if they fail, are detected and removed from service or routed around as quickly as possible. But the thing that can go wrong with health checks is that if the thing that's taking things out of service is a little too aggressive or gets something wrong, works on the wrong signal, it could actually take a little minor problem and create a massive problem. 
Um, similar one is caching. Caching is a very, very commonly used tool throughout Amazon, and I'm sure all of you use it. Um, and it can, it can improve the efficiency, it can improve latency for typical use cases, but caches have a way of introducing a modal behavior into the system where suddenly your system is making heavy use of the cache, and then maybe because of a software deployment or some other kind of unforeseen circumstance, you can stop using the cache all of a sudden, and then it browns out the whole system. So it's a, it's a really interesting set of articles. Um, we hope that, that you find things that, you, that are interesting and useful. Um, we are going to be, you can, um, oh, that's at the bottom, yeah. You can, um, you can you go to the site there, uh, at aws.amazon.com slash builders library. Um, we'll be talking about these uh, articles and, and, and with you all on Reddit and Twitch. So uh, stay tuned for more, and, and hopefully that you find them useful. Uh, we'll be taking um, questions out kind of in that hallway area before the main hallway. Um, but thank you very much for coming.